Uh, Shadow is a wonderful show. I wanted to, con on behalf of all of us, congratulations. Uh, Netflix is, is something I think has become part of the fabric uh, of the world in terms of watching and, and your ability and your team's ability to bring um, destigmatize. I wanted to, to start off by asking you what, what was the impetus for you creating this, this show? Yeah, you know, I think, um, you know, so many of us live, in, particularly in Africa and South Africa with our history, you know, there's, there's a history of, of inequality. Um, and there's, I think, a lot of frustrated people around. So we wanted to create a fun kind of uh, modern popular show um, where there's a character who can almost go through this world and address some of those injustices um, and, and do it in a safe way. So, you know, you can sit in your living room, you can watch the show, you can, there's, there's an element of wish fulfillment because you can kind of through the eyes of the shadow character go through, take out all these bad guys, do all the things that you maybe want to do in your life that you aren't legally allowed to do. So I think, you know, look, it's a fun show, but you know, South Africa, particularly with its turbulent past, um, you know, we deal with quite a lot of in inequality. It's something we deal with uh, every day. And uh, yeah, I think Shadow struck a bit of a nerve. I think it was nice to, to, to have fun with this character, but at the same time, just acknowledge the fact that there's a lot of frustrated people out there and, and he provides a window into a slightly uh, different world. You know, one of the things that I appreciated so much about watching the show is a lot of people, there are, there's a lot of characterizations out there about what Africa, I, I uh, actually have family that live in Joburg as well as Cape Town. Wow. So one of the things I wanted to say is that you all do a wonderful job in demystifying uh, as well as stigmatizing uh, what an urban city in Africa actually looks like and feels like, how beautiful the landscapes are. So thank you so very much for that. Um, what was your decision to go for Joburg versus maybe a Cape Town? Um, really, I'd love to give an intellectual answer here, but the, the selfish answer is that we're based in Joburg, our studio okay. is based here, and we feel that Joburg as a city is kind of underrepresented, even locally in terms of shows. A lot of shows um, in the advertising industry that can all go down to Cape Town where it's so beautiful, it's Table Mountain and beautiful waters and so on. You know, Joburg isn't all that pretty, um, but it's got a lot of history and it's gritty and there's lots of, there's lots of cool elements to Joburg. So yeah, we thought we'd, um, we, we'd shoot it in our, in our city. Um, and that's, that's the, the basic answer, I guess. Yeah. And, and honest, we appreciate that. So tell <laughs> us a little bit more about yourself as a filmmaker. How did you get into filmmaking? Ah, uh, yeah. So it was it was crazy. Um, several several years ago, uh, myself and a friend, we were sitting around my pool, and and I, my youngest daughter had just been born, and we were we were having a drink, uh, and and I just had this thing in my head. I just said to him, you know, we we're such film buffs. I, th I thought, you know, we just have to make make a film. So my background is I'm a writer. I'm an ex journalist. Um, I then became a novelist. I've written seven novels. So you know, writing was always a part of the game, but I just love film. So I said to him, let's make a film. And he said, well, how do we do that? You know, we don't have a crew. We don't know what we're doing. It would be a joke. And I said, well, let's have a crack. So what we did, um, which was hell of a fun, is I, I realized, you know, we weren't complete idiots. We realized that in order for us to make a film that would kind of work, we would have to shoot it on a very limited setting, only have two or three actors, and really try and create something atmospheric. You know, you can't shoot the Avengers with yourself and a mate next to a pool. So we were very realistic about what we could do. So off we went um, with no funding, no backing, no knowledge. We went into the industry. We spoke to some people. They all told us we were crazy. I uh, happened to convince a third friend of mine who's my current partner in business, Fred Vormerans. I convinced him to come on board. And the three of us, literally the three of us made this film. And it's um, it's it's called Taken. It stars Liam Neeson. I don't know if you're not kidding. It's not that Taken. It's a different Taken. Um, and it really it talks. It tells the story of these two students who wake up in this basement, and kind of underground labyrinth of tunnels, and they don't know why they're there. And it's it's kind of quite a decent little thriller. We made it for no money. Uh, we went to our local broadcaster when we were done, and I think we shot the thing in like 10 days, edited in 10 days. It was, it was, I mean, it was crazy. We took it to our national broadcaster and they just bought it. And the next thing that we knew, a prime time on our local channel, there was this amateur film that we'd made. And it was just surreal to sit there and see this, this little hobby uh, come to life. And that's what started it. So it was a crazy beginning. And we've obviously come, uh, come a long way since then, but we literally made a film with three or four guys and, and three or four actors, but it was, it was terrific fun. 
Well, that's a good segue for me to talk about uh, screenwriting and adaptation. So being a novelist, you already understood the story world and of course the character world. Um, what, tell us what was your process of being able to go from being a novelist to screenwriting as a very distilled process? What was that like for you? Yeah, it's, it's, it's very different. And, you know, obviously with, with film and TV shows, you, you know, you know, dialogue, dialogue's there, but one has to be as visual as you possibly can. So it was actually tough for me because, you know, the novelist world, it's all about words. It's all about dialogue. You, you can get really carried away. And obviously it's a, it's a much longer form. So it is about understanding what the key moments were, understanding the beats. Um, and I think, I think critically, you know, the whole show, don't tell thing, the whole, um, you know, don't, don't say what you can show, rural the show. And I, I think I still struggle with that. Um, I think I'm, I'm a little bit in, the, in the Aaron Sorkin, well, let me not flatter myself, I'm not Aaron Sorkin, <laughs> but I'm, I'm in that camp where I'm very wordy and very mouthy um, with my scripts. And it's something I constantly am working on. I don't think I'm there yet. And I think most novelists uh, face this problem. Um, so yeah, but I think, I think we are getting better. And fortunately my partners are quite good at saying, well, why don't we cut that piece of dialogue and rather just show X and Y, you know? So um, it's been a journey, um, but yeah, look, they are completely different worlds. And obviously we are hugely hamstrung by our budgets. You know, when you're a novelist, my first novel, which did really well actually in America is called Finding Jack, a story about uh, the Vietnam War and the dogs and soldiers and all sorts of things. And you can write about whatever you like, you know? Now you get to a film set and you've got virtually no money and all the great things you're gonna write about just aren't achievable. So I think, Good advice for any, any starting out uh, filmmakers or writers is just write it small and atmospheric. The Haunted House on the Hill is fine if you've got a house, if you've got a couple of mate actors, you can make something, you know, and you can grow and learn from there. So I always say to my partners, I'm, I'm, I'm writing with oven mitts on. You know, you can't always write what you want. And you, you know how expensive things are. So your scenes all of a sudden you go, well, guys, this is going to be a three minute table scene of dialogue because we don't have the luxury of anything more. And then you save the money scenes for when you can afford them. So, but it's a huge difference and I struggle with it daily. Well, I, you're not alone, even for Sorkin, all writing is rewriting, you know. <laughs> exactly. And I don't think anybody ever feels like they, they're even up to the point where you're shooting. I think a, a lot of writers, directors, which you are, and we'll get to that a little bit later on, uh, have that same feeling. So you're in uh, exceptional co um, company to say the least. <laughs> but with that being said, so what was the, you know, I, I love the relationship um, with Max. And the, this is, it's, it's a brother, they kind of play off of each other. I love the, the, the relationship um, uh, Shadow has with his sister Lolo as well, but talk to me about what was the hardest part of creating this show in making sure that you talked about the limited amount of characters for some other films and this, this too, each episode can stand alone, but your primary characters, what was the hardest part of creating the show for those characters and making sure that they all had their complete arcs. I think the problem that we faced is, you know, we 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 in a genre um, where there have been a zillion buddy cop kind of uh, films and TV series, and and obviously done at the Hollywood level with massive set pieces and exploding buildings and all the rest. And obviously we we don't have that. So the biggest challenge I faced as a writer and as the co-director was to try with our limited budget, try to come up with something that was watchable, that, that reflected Africa a little, um, that reflected the African culture and the people, and was intriguing enough to hold your attention uh, without all the fireworks. Um, so, you know, for that reason, some of the episodes are quite different. Like in episode two of Shadow, we created this, this evil villain um, who, who is obsessed with snow globes and he, he, he kidnaps beautiful women and, and puts them in these massive plastic snow globes and visually it's quite arresting so you know we try I tried it I tried my best to come up with um with novel ideas and to and to avoid the many many tropes um that are out there and the tropes that we couldn't avoid we just kind of leaned into mm -hmm. and, and try to pay homage to to the, the real pros out there but um you know like to give an idea if we have one car chase with a, with a car exploding that's our entire budget for the episode so we had to we had to be very careful about what we did so i think that the main challenge was to try and bring a fresh voice um to the genre the much beloved genre the very popular genre um we were a little worried that we went uh, a little too formulaic episode to episode you know it starts middle has starts has a middle and ends 
and then you move on to the next episode. And yes, of course, their, their storylines are carry over. But the modern approach is more telling one grand story. Um, and we worry that that was perhaps a little outdated. But there's a lot of people that find comfort in, in that format and enjoy it. And obviously, there's lots of shows out there today that still do it. So I think for us, it was really just about trying to bring some Africa and, and a fresh view uh, to a genre that's been, been done really well by Hollywood and, and, and the UK. So one of uh, Shadow's superpowers is that he he has the inability to feel pain um, caused by the him being struck by lightning uh, as as a child. Who came up with that? That that feels to me somewhere in the the Marvel DC universe. <laughs> Will, yeah, I think at the time, actually, I think uh, there was some Luke Cage stuff that was out, and I think Luke Cage had some similar attributes. I think um, for us. Okay, I keep hammering on the budget, which I'll stop in a minute. But um, it's also about what we were able to produce as a small team. You know, we're a we're a core crew of four, um, and 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 it, we crew up obviously, uh, but not to a great degree. So uh, you know, we have to come up with things that, that are achievable and doable with, with, within our team, and something that I think is reasonably believable. So um, I think it's called what I call it, SEPA or congenital. Uh, I've actually forgotten the term, but. Being able to not feel pain is a real thing. And it can be, you can be born with it, or it can be a consequence of nerve damage that you suffer. So what we liked about it is that it was, you know, it's, it's a sprinkle of supernaturalness, but, but it is a genuine thing that can happen. Um, and, and in fact, what I tried to do with it from a writing and a character perspective, I try to use it more as a weakness um, that he has rather than a strength, because if you can't feel pain, there's a downside to that. So, you know, for us, it was about trying to bring something a little fresh to the character, not something terribly outlandish, and then to use that attribute um, in solving his own personal journey. We won't give away any spoilers, but that then comes to play towards the end of the season. Yes, it does. And so I don't know if everyone has seen all of the episodes. I won't give it away, although I wanted to take that rabbit hole. I'll stop right there. But <laughs> let, let me, let's talk a little bit about diverse voices. There's a lot of talk. Um, and there's a lot of questions among, especially the younger emerging writers about the ability to talk about from a, a diverse perspective, diverse voices, representation. Um, what was your approach to be able to tell stories that not just thematically resonated with everyone, but to take on the, the, the opportunity to tell a, a voice of um, an African man and uh, his abilities, his inabilities, but just a, a genuine story. Yeah, I think that's a huge challenge, you know, as, as a, a white middle-aged South African, um, again, given our history, um, you know, we, we felt a lot of pressure because, you know, we, we, we in a way, we kind of torch bearing a little bit, being the first Netflix original. Uh, we knew it was going global. We knew we'd get some some eyes on it from, from all over the place. And I think it was important that we, we, we got that as, as right as we could. Um, so I was very sensitive to it and, you know, worked a lot with the actors and with other writers, African writers, and obviously the actors themselves. And we, we collaborated together, especially on the dialogue, especially on the nuances, the body language, you know, how the guys shake hands, you know, all those small things make such, such a big difference. And, and I don't think we got it right, actually, to be fair. I think I, think I dropped the ball in some cases, and I think it's, it's certainly something we have to keep working on. In our latest show, in fact, I mean, we, we have in chats now about how we can improve that, you know, and it's it's important because the last thing you want is is it, it's not even a color thing. It's 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 maybe a gender thing as well, you know, a male um, creating a a patronizing female voice or something that doesn't do justice to the female character. So we hyper sensitive about it, and and it's something that we work on all the time. And and I think the key thing is to collaborate with African voices, and make sure we get it as right as we can. So I'm going to go there. Because were you born in Africa? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, so that make, and makes you African, correct? It does. Yes, it does. I certainly, you know, we have, I th I'm going to get this wrong, but I think we have 13 official languages. We have many different cultures in Africa. And, you know, it's kind of weird. I suppose my, my descendants are kind of uh, UK based. Um, they would have come on the ships uh, uh, to two uh, generations ago. So I suppose my her heritage is more British. And the problem with that is being born into Africa, but with, you know, our media here is all American and British. Um, our Christmas traditions are American. Um, all the Hollywood stars, you know, all the, all the big American brands we consume. So we these kind of weird um, 
Hong Kong <laughs> kind of fake American British people in, in a weird sort of way. And obviously that, that's very different to um, the African communities that have been living here for generations. Right. And, you know, it's important that we, we bridge that divide. Um, and I think what's great about South Africa, as I said, we have a very dark past, but we're in a very, very different space now. Things aren't perfect, but um, it's, it's a multiracial, multicultural society. Um, we've got such a terrific uh, cast and crew when we come together and um yeah it's just it's it's been a terrific journey and i've got young kids and they've come on set and they've seen how well everything works and we have a mixed family ourselves um so so yeah as i, as I keep saying it's just it's, it's hugely important that we don't uh, demand what we're doing and we take it very seriously and we make sure that all the voices are heard that's good now you one of the decisions you all made i to your point, there are so many different languages and I, you made the decision to go every now and then people would revert to their native tongue. What language was that Swahili? What language were, were they go back and forth in? There was a combination of, I think there would have been some causa as well, maybe some vendor, but I think uh, predominantly it was Zulu. And the idea there is, you know, from a business perspective, unfortunately for us, obviously there's some business imperatives beyond what we do. We knew that if we wanted to make a global show, we didn't want to potentially go into full vernacular language, full African language, and expect people to read subtitles. If only we knew that Squid, what the Squid, Squid Games, Squid, um, the big show on Netflix at the moment, um, Korean fully subtitled. If only we knew that, you know, the whole world is very happy to watch subtitles and perhaps we would have made a, a bolder choice in that regard. But I think, you know, we wanted it to be a show that internationally it's English speaking, that people can follow easily. But then obviously it's flavored um, at the right times with, with African African languages, which are, which hopefully for Americans and Brits and Canadians, it just lends it that slightly exotic feel, you know. So this this show first debuted in 2019. Oh, I'm terrible with dates. I couldn't even tell you. You know, the problem with us is we lag so far behind because we produce it almost years. Um, obviously, prior to that, there's the editing process. So I think it landed in 2019, but we probably started working on it in in 2017, 20 early 2018. Even. So it's been a, a while ago now. Yeah. And thinking about that and the decision to go to Netflix, did you all, was this something that you pitched out to them? Did they hear about you through another means? How did you, what was that journey to Netflix like? Um, this is a funny story. So um, <laughs> being Africans, uh, my story is often un unconventional. So, uh, so what we did is a completely different approach and a ridiculous approach, really. So what we did is we... Um, we created Shadow ourselves um, with no backing, apart from our brilliant angel investor, Chris. Chris, thank you. Um, and what we did is we, are at, at in risk to ourselves, full risk, we went off and just made the TV series. We then went to the market afterwards in the hope that we would find a buyer. Now, obviously, that's that's fairly ludicrous because there's every chance that the buyers would say, well, no, thanks. And now you're sitting with a, a huge bull um, and a very unhappy wife. Um, but fortunately, uh, um, Netflix were, were they'd been terrific partners. They came on board. Um, they gave us some input. They loved the show. Um, and and we, we collaborated together to get it done. And um, yeah, the rest is history. Netflix have been uh, tremendous partners ever since. Uh, so it's been it's been wonderful. One well, an, another thing I was I was thinking about and watching the show the second time um, was about wow. casting and how important um, was it for you to choose a lead character character to not just someone that was regional but someone that can have a real mainstream appeal. Yes, we were we were very lucky. We we're big fans of the lead actor, uh, Palance Gladwell. He's a terrific guy, and he's one of those people who just walks into a room and and has has real presence. Um, I'm a bit worried. My wife likes him a lot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he just really does. I mean, everyone, you know, the, the crew, he just turns heads. He, he's got this quiet authority. You know, when he's not acting, he speaks very softly. Everyone lowers down to listen to him. Um, and he's, he's quite a deep and reflective guy as well. And, and we just felt that not only did he have great international look, he sounded quite international. He's almost got a bit of an American twang. It's weird, um, but he's, he's just got it. And in the local shows that he's been in, he's got a huge following. People just absolutely love him. And we felt he would be a very comfortable, to be very easy for him to transition to, to international 
audiences and we and we think we got that right and in fact his co-star the max character another terrific human being Cartu, um he's just the most likable guy i mean the guy the character he plays is very close to who he is just super likable friendly just gets on with everyone so i think we were very lucky and then we had amanda dupont as our female lead and she's like an Instagram star. I think she makes way more money out of Instagram than she makes on our on our shows. Um, but she's also really got a great following. And she's such a, I mean, she's an exquisite uh, woman and she's very strong. We're all scared of Amanda. She kind of bullies us on set because she is so strong and she's so bright. Um, you know, you cannot get into an intellectual argument with her unless you know what you're talking about. She will she will tear you and you, you know. Um, so so no, we were very lucky, but I, I, I'd like to think that we got it right. Um, but perhaps you guys would be the better judge of that. No, you got it right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so you mentioned Zulu. Does everyone speak Zulu, including yourself? Um, I, I know snatches, embarrassingly, um, and I, it's, I'm so self-conscious when I try it because I just feel like such a fool. Um, but Zulu is is is, is a very big language um, mm -hmm. in South Africa, especially one of our provinces. Um, Zulu Kosa, I would say, probably are, are the dominant languages. Um, but as I say, there are 13 of them. So, yeah, it's tough to keep track. Well, yes. I, I want to say this, you know, your stories were very crisp. I mean, right down to the point. I, I looked at Shadow as a, a living battery, right? He, he literally wouldn't stop until justice was sold. Uh, I want to talk about the relationship that he had with uh, Nola. Um, and yeah. who was a perfect foil and his, his, his best friend, Max. Did you initially cast them for those parts or were other people in line to play those parts before you got to them? Yeah, we, you know, the casting process, um, we went through a lot of people and there were just some people that jumped out at us. So there were, there were definitely occasions and any, any, any crew will tell you this, but there's occasions where one, one actor is auditioning for one character and then that, that's not the character they'll end up playing. Mm -hmm. So I can't even remember, to be honest, uh, which characters they auditioned for. I'd be lying if I said they auditioned for those characters They may not have. My memory is shocking. But nonetheless, when we saw them on camera, they just both lit up. Um, and I think uh, Lola, is, she just has this ability to, to make you cry. I mean, she can yes. cry on tap. It's like a superpower. Mm -hmm. And she's just so sincere and so kind of, you know, her acting's never forced. It's just so easy for her. And she just makes everyone on set kind of, kind of we just sort of look at it and go kind of, wow, you know, she's, she's, she's terrific. So I think it was more a case of when we cast, often we're not, it sounds bizarre, but we're not all that interested in the characters they're casting for. We're just looking for that something. And then often what, the great advantage we have is such a small crew and the fact that I write the show, what I'll often do is if I find an actor I like, I will then rewrite the character for them to suit their strengths. Uh -huh. and, and, and I think that's great. So like even on, on the day, and it's funny, just even, even the, the phrasing of sentences, you, some actors will have, have um, a problem constructing a sentence with a certain run of vowels or consonants, and then you just change it to suit them. So I think one of our, one of our small strength was, was that we could adapt um, so much and at the absolute 11th hour. So we were constantly, I was constantly, I've never finished the script. We just keep rewriting the night before, the morning of, while we're on set. Um, but I think that's been our strength, finding the correct actors to play the roles we want and then tailoring those 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 roles to suit them. Well, you mentioned having a, an, a I would call it abbreviated crew, but it's, it goes to say you can make a really big show. It doesn't take, it might put people out of the work thinking that, you know, you don't need one person to hold a cup and another person to hold the saucer. Uh, <laughs> with that, you know, with that being said, you and uh, Fred, I don't want to butcher his last name, is it Vomerantz? Perfect, yes, that's correct. Yay! <laughs> We're the co-directors for, for all eight episodes. Um, that says a lot about your relationship. It says a lot about the vision uh, that you, you all have for the show. But was co-directing challenging? Yeah, I'd say it is, you know. Um, the problem with filmmaking, as, as filmmakers who, who are watching this will know, is that you're just confronted with a thousand decisions a day. You know, whether it's wardrobe running into its art department, um, of which in our case is often the same person. Uh, you know, you're just confronted with so many decisions. Um, so, I mean, Fred and I have been working together for years now. And, and the great thing about, about Fred is he's, he's a terrific human being. And we can have a little, little go at each other, a little argument. It can be a heated moment at three o'clock in the morning. But... 
our relationship, uh, not just with Fred, but with my partners, Nick and Phil as well, and with Chris, there's a bedrock underneath that. And I think it's so critical that, um, you know, as a team, you guys don't take things personally. And if someone's having a bit of a bad moment, it's quickly forgotten about and you move on. But I think what's terrific ab about uh, the partnership that Fred and I have, Fred's very bright. I'd say he's a lot brighter than me. But I think where we complement each other is that I work with the actors um, and I work with the um uh, with a story so i'm always focused on that whereas fred's more focused he's more technical he's more focused on camera and he loves action sequences so so he'll often really step in with that so the nice thing is we don't we don't really step on each other's toes too much and obviously you know there's lots of chat between us um but it's been terrific and 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 i don't see any reason why why, why it'll change going forward that's a huge compliment Sometimes you work with people and you say, this was a great run, but I never want to work with this person again. <laughs> well, I'm not, I'm not sure if Fred feels the same way. That's how I feel. <laughs> so I, I've, I've got to say this because this show I have recommended to so many of my, um, my, my girlfriends, as well as some of my guy friends, um, my my husband doesn't like for me how I just deeply stare into uh, the subject I'm, I'm about to talk about. Let's, they say that violence and nudity shouldn't be gratuitous, okay? Um, yeah. And, but we see quite a bit of skin from, from violence, okay? <laughs> Which I enjoy. I'm not going to back down from that. I'm like, yay for that. Uh, but was this conscious scripted decision or, you know, did you have uh how did that come about well you see that i mean that's the thing if i'd cast myself in the lead role i would have shot the whole thing in the track seat but you know palance being palance he is is it he's a specimen he is in yes. terrific shape so yeah. you know if you tap him on the shoulder it's like tapping a table um yeah he's just i think he's obsessive i, I don't know what his gym sessions are like but i imagine they're ridiculous um so you know Again, it's the tailoring. So when we met Palance and we saw what a specimen he was, and our casting agent was kind of fainting in the corner, we were like, okay, okay, there's something here. Let's not ignore it. So I created a, a couple of beats where he, he kind of, I, th I think in the one episode, um, he's under orders and he has to strip down in, in a pub, in a bar, and he has to go and you know do some things. Um, and, and that was terrific fun filming. It's obviously quite embarrassing for him. But he is really good, and we just be kind of silly um, to not take advantage of that. But having said that, that's really not not what the show was about. It was a bit of coloring. It was a bit of fun. I think a bit tongue in cheek as well. Um, mm -hmm. But sure, the guy's in shape, man. The guy's in shape. I should look at his diet plan, but it's, it looks exhausting, and the training must be exhausting. So I think I'll just I'll stick behind the camera. Ah, well, um, I, I I have to I have to say that because one, it's one of the things that I teach as a a as a lecturer at UCSB is that, you know, it shouldn't be gratuitous. It doesn't mean you have to shy away from it. It just needs to, to your point, it should have a beat. It should have a reason for being there. Yeah. And in every single scene when, when uh, he doesn't have to show, it is for a, a lot of time, it's, it's a, a breath of fresh air, but it has its purpose. One of my favorite scenes is uh, in, in the, the pilot episode and uh, he's sitting there after the woman has spent the night for her birthday after having birthday shots and the sister's like oh my god really why and, and you know uh, and then you've got lola saying okay i'll live here this is this is going to be nice so where do you feel that your the show has received its best support well <clears throat> sadly we don't think it was locally and there's probably a couple of reasons for that i think when it came out uh, on netflix i think the netflix audience in in south africa and certainly in africa was quite small i think you know as internet bandwidth gets improves um that that's going to become less and less of an issue so i think the audience was reasonably niche um and i don't think it quite meet, met um, netflix's expectations obviously they were really keen for it to do well in south africa and in africa and then i think what happens beyond africa is of secondary importance to them look i don't want to put words in their mouths but that's that's what we feel um so it, i don't think it quite resonated locally um it seems like your wonderful country and your neighbors canada um and i think the uk as well really really responded well i mean we get a lot of Males and so on, um, and, and a lot of them are from are, are from people from the states, um, Canada and the UK. And what's 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 funny and ridiculous and quite stupid again, budget. Um, a lot of the telephone numbers that you see on screen in the show belong to us, so it's quite an interesting barometer. We get calls all the time, 
and and someone will say oh can i speak to gg um, or can i speak to shadow or whatever the case is and sometimes we answer and we have a conversation with the person on the other end and it's kind of fun because they they're fans of the show and and they've they've taken a chance and they've called the number and now you know we get to talk to them as filmmakers and it's quite nice it's kind of research we can say well what episode are you on are you enjoying it you know so it's 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 a little silly um i don't think we'll be making that mistake again but um it's been actually great to interact with the fans not all the fans are sane though so you just got to be careful who you're talking to Oh, wow. Um, I, you know, it's interesting. I, I saw a couple of the numbers. Maybe I should just give you a call. No, I'm, I'm, I'm totally joking. Um, you know, we know that sometimes word of mouth and, and repeat viewership drives those algorithms for streaming. In the United States, Netflix has become uh, almost a um, an adjective. People don't say, let's go out for coffee. They say, let's grab Starbucks. And yeah, though they yeah. really don't mean Starbucks. And when people think Netflix, they just kind of revolve that around streaming. But in Africa, you, you mentioned um, the bandwidth. Uh, in the United States and in Canada, people have Netflix on their phones. Yeah. Um, uh, is that not the case there? No, look, it is. Um, we all have Netflix on our phones, which we watch fairly religiously. Um, I think the issue is that, you know, certainly in terms of the demographics of our country and the socioeconomics of our country, yeah, it's, the internet's quite, quite expensive. So I think there's, there's a certain uh, section of the population that has ridiculously good uh, internet connections and 5G and all those, all those crazy things. But, you know, there's a lot of the, the less affluent people who don't quite have it, but, but it is changing rapidly. So we... We think Africa is the last big kind of marketplace frontier, even for the likes of Hollywood. And that's the reason why Amazon are coming out here, Disney Plus are coming out here, Netflix are here, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that's because you know, the numbers in Africa are enormous. So, you know, as, as Hollywood starts to get subscribers out here, um, I think there's, uh, there's a hell, hell of a lot of uh, uh, new customers to be gained and a lot, a lot of money to be made, obviously. So, no, it's changing rapidly. And I think that's what's really exciting for us. So we very, very fortunate to be in the position that we're in. We're in an established studio now. Um, we're in a market that's growing exponentially. And that's very exciting. And it's become so accessible to, um, to, to local South Africans and, and Africans. But again, as internet prices keep coming down, I think the likes of Netflix and the other streamers are just, are just going to climb ridiculously. You've mentioned before that um, South Africa has a dark past. America has a dark past as well. Um, sure. We share that. Yeah. Um, and uh, in leadership, you have your leadership there has emerged um, from those of, of persons of color, persons like Mandela, uh, as we have here. Um, so a lot has happened in the 20th century and, and the perspectives and the diversity and uh, the sense of inclusion. So um, looking at that for the average person, Right, um, and you mentioned how expensive it could be uh, for for viewers. Um, what does that? What does Netflix prices look like there versus? And I know you spend time here in, in, in America. I know I have some crazy version of Netflix, which allows my kids, I guess, to watch it in HD. But what is the cost factor there for someone to be able to watch a Netflix? Well, I mean, the thing is, it's actually not the Netflix pricing that's the issue. We think Netflix's pricing is ridiculously it's fair. Yeah, it's, it's, it's terrific. So I think Netflix have really come to the party. And I think, I mean, I'm not just saying that because we work with them. I mean, we've just, we, you know, if you look at the price point of what they asking of consumers versus some of the more established players we've had in the past, there's, there's a significant difference. Um, that's not to say those players don't face their, their own challenges. I mean, there's probably reasons for there's very good reasons for it, I'm sure. But it's more the case of what the average South African survives on daily. Okay. And if you're deciding between, you know, food, sending your kid to school, school shoes versus oh. a luxury item like Netflix, it's, it's tough, you know, and, yeah. um, but I really can't fault Netflix's pricing. They're terrific. Oh, good. Good to know. Thank you, Netflix. <laughs> Thank you, Netflix. <laughs> um, so there's a, been a lot of discussions I've been following. Is there are there any news about a second season for for Shadow? I won't I won't do the spoiler like uh, alert of how season eight. I mean episode eight ends, but. 
Well, never say never. I mean, Netflix have have the rights for another couple of years, um, and and you know they might still pull the trigger at some point. And if not, perhaps we can take it elsewhere, and perhaps there'll be appetite uh, with whoever that person or entity may may be. Uh, for now, no. A um, little sad for us. We we, we think they were quite close. Uh, to green lighting a second season. But in fairness to them, I think they also wanted to explore other shows and other voices. Um, and they've been very successful with some other African original shows. So, I mean, we've, we've certainly got no problem with that. And I think Netflix uh, is well known globally that they prefer to, instead of having a second season, rather have a first season of something else. I think I think if you look through their records, there's a lot of that, you know, and we, we can't fault that. I think, I think uh, look, I, I might be speaking complete nonsense here, but our understanding really is that for the most part, you will have diminishing subscribers season one to season two to season three. So I suppose logically you have to think, well, you know, why, why would they want to do that? You know, as opposed to the next big show, I think for, for Netflix and again, don't want to put words in their mouth, but I think it's about that excitement, the, the something new, the something fresh. So, you know, we understand that. I think uh, we've had a lot of fans asking us, a lot of people contact us, you know, when yes. season two comes out. And, we, and it's, it's tough, you know, we don't want to disappoint them. We, we'd love to do a season two, but um, we, we respect and understand the reasons why Netflix have not uh, pulled the trigger. Well, uh, we are we are hoping for the best for you. Um, we're going to take some questions, but here's my last question to you. Uh, in terms of other content that you're creating, what's what's on deck? Yeah, so um, we've actually uh, a, a new show that we did has just launched, um, and again, Netflix are partners in Africa, Latin America, Middle East. Um, it's called Dead Places. And um, it's available on AMC, Sundowns, Sundowns Now, and I think All Black. I hope I'm not butchering that. Um, and yeah, it's called Dead Places. And I suppose my closest comparison is it's a paranormal show, a little bit like X-Files. It's a kind of X-Files from Africa. And it tells the story of this British author. I could write an author. That was fantastic. I enjoyed that. A Brit British author comes out to South Africa to investigate um, paranormal activity in South Africa. So every episode, there's a new interesting case uh, he investigates and it's we really like to think it's terrific fun um because you, you get to see a, a world that that you haven't seen before there's lots of intrigue around africa we have trees here that are like two and a half thousand years old they're like predate christ and christianity so we've got you know we, we just have such terrific things in africa so we've capitalized on that and show's done really really well we believe it was number one in in netflix's biggest second biggest market brazil so our little African show made number one in Brazil, which is terrific. And it's doing well in AMC. Uh, one of our friends was telling us that it's um, it's it's like the, well, one of the top picks at the moment on AMC+. Plus. Um, so it's doing really well. So if, if you guys enjoy fun, paranormal stuff, we didn't take it too seriously. It's a little tongue in cheek. There's some humor, but definitely some spooky stuff as well. Um, yeah, Dead Places, please check it out. Oh, we definitely will. Well, we've got a few questions. Um, one question is, Abby points out, that all of Shadow's clients are women. And in another, Ashley says that she's not another woman who needs Shadow to save her. Can you talk a little bit about how you thought about the show's relationship to these women and are in, in jeopardy? And yeah, so I, I think I think the biggest trope one has to avoid, obviously, is the, the damsel in distress. And I think I think we largely got that right. Um, you know, and, and because we had such strong female actors on set they wouldn't allow me to write a damsel in distress and get away with it so so i think i think we focus uh you know quite heavily on that and i think um most of our women save themselves and in the end i think i think the, a lot of the weaknesses in the in the male characters and the problems that they have and the conflict that they have and, and the issues that they can't solve um so i don't know if we got the balance perfectly right you know the, the great big problem about making tv shows is you try as hard as you can but you're always going to offend some people so i don't know if we got it right um but I, but I, I think we have in our new show dead places if you watch it you'll see there's some very very kick-ass if i can say that uh, female characters and 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 yeah some 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 interesting twists um with their characters uh the second question is it, you show the Episode two talks about that snow globe. This is a good question. How did you decide to focus on snow globes and how expensive was that giant snow globe effect? That's another great story. So um, what, what we do, uh, what we do um, is we try and, and find clever things that exist in the world that we can take advantage of. 
uh, without spending a lot of money. Uh, or in this case, I just, I thought it was a kind of a novel idea to have this snow globe character. Um, so but now the challenge, of course, is to find or create a, a, a giant snow globe. So my partner, Nick, he's our cinematographer, he does our special effects, very, very bright human being. Um, I think it was Nick, oh, maybe I'm wrong. Um, he went to a local shopping center and he happened to notice that they were doing one of those kind of Christmas installations where there'd be like a Santa in the plastic bubble. And he asked if there's any chance when they finished with it, whether we could borrow it. And they said, yeah, why not go for it? And I don't think we ever returned it, to be honest. So, um, so it's, it's, it's a store globe that we just kind of converted. And for, I'm giving stuff away, but for eagle-eyed viewers, if you, if you look at some of the wide shots, we put all these branches at the base of this uh, globe. And that's because at the base, I think it says like, welcome shoppers or something uh, equally <laughs> inane. Um, and, and that's, but that's the great thing about independent okay. filmmaking. You have to make plans. So I think right. we created this spooky kind of feel, um, but it was really for free. Um, and, and that's that's part of the art of, of being independent filmmakers is doing that sort of stuff. But what is, what is terrible about that damn globe was that filming in there was was really bad because you know there's little bits of uh, polystyrene and styrofoam and it's in your eyes and your nose and your ears and our poor cinematographers half choking to death and our actors are sneezing and it was horrible filming inside there but i think the the um the, the lasting effect of it it was 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 pretty cool i will say i thought that was really i thought it was really brilliant but really creepy yeah, it was creepy. And the really actor, creepy. and the actor's very creepy. Um, and, yes. and even when he's not acting, he's very different. He, I thought he was terrific. And he's got such an interesting bone structure in his face. It's very yes. sharp, like, you know, jaw bones and, and, and cheekbones. And um, yeah, he's, he was good. He was very good. Yeah, he was one of those characters that if I saw him on the street, I would walk faster. <laughs> yeah, exactly. On the side of the street, walk, walk faster. <laughs> we do have another question. Um, as a writer, what's the biggest obstacle you have to overcome and how did you overcome that obstacle? I think it comes down to a little bit what I was touching on previously. It's just because writing for television is, is so, so restricted by budget and by time constraints and, and, and by various other constraints. You know, you've, you've got to know what, to, what, what the actor's strengths and weaknesses are. I think, uh, my, but, but looking inwardly now at myself as a writer, I think the biggest challenge is, is not to write characters where they start sounding the same, you know, because you you one writer, I don't have a writer's room, right? So we can't bounce characters around and get unique voices. So if you're not careful, everyone starts using the same sort of language, the same sort of, you know, um, phrases and so on. So I think one of the challenges as a writer, as a lone writer, is to, is to go through your, your scripts and make sure that th there are two distinct characters here and not one uh, or not three characters that sound the same. And that's, that's kind of a challenge that, that I wasn't fully aware of until I started noticing early on that some of my characters was, was sounding too much the same. Uh, so I'd say that's, that's probably one of the biggest challenges, but certainly the big difference between the novels, which is just limitless. You can just write whatever you want. I mean, obviously there's some research involved, but you're not limited by, by money, but obviously on a set uh, you are. And weather, of course, weather is another massive limiting factor. I've got this is my question to you. Something I just thought about was um, one of the things you we talk about in writing is creating empathy. Yeah, yeah. Um, for characters and really being able to to root them on. Um, in your storytelling process, uh, what are some things that you remind yourself on on the onset to be able to? to create empathy for a character. And empathy doesn't have to mean the person's a good person. We can have empathy for Hannibal Lecter. Yeah. Um, but what's your process to remind yourself that this is a trigger that you have to pull very early? I'm glad, glad you asked the question. Thank you. Um, it's something that's very important to me. So in my novel writing, I, I, it's, it's all about emotion. All the stuff I've ever written, it's, it's all kind of sad, kind of morose, and hopefully uplifting stories as well, but it's all about emotion. So my kind of criticism, I mean, who am I, I'm independent filmmaker, um, you know, haven't achieved anything in terms of what Hollywood can do. So take this from whence it comes, but my criticism of some of the big uh, tentpole films, you know, big Transformers films, I mean, they are incredible in what they've achieved technically, you just, you, you know, you cannot compete with that. You, you cannot argue that, but I sometimes feel it just lacks 
that empathy, that emotion. And then what I find personally, maybe it's just me, I mean, everyone else seems to, to love this stuff, is that I tune out after a while. You know, you can only blow up so many buildings or so many monsters or so many robots. If you don't feel empathy for the characters, you just feel disconnected from it. And I think all the color and the light and the noise, it kind of lulls you after a while. I often fall asleep in this big tent pole films but then i'll watch a beautiful independent film that's been shot um you know on, on the sniff of an oil rag no money some great actors small setting and I, I barely blink you know and i think it's um it's just the most crucial thing so with shadow i don't have that much room to do that because we you gotta understand the genre you you know it's action it's, it's 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 human all those good things but i tried as best i could to bring 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 the empathy uh, there because if it isn't there when your character's on his journey and he's getting to the end of his journey if you don't feel anything you've you've completely failed so I'd like to think that's a strength of of, of mine in the writing generally um, one of the weaknesses is action I, I, I often in the scripts I'll say insert action scene here a, a little bit and leave it to my partner um, but now for me empathy is absolutely critical and we'll try to find those find those little moments where. You can help build empathy. But as you rightly say, it's not necessarily about having uh, characters that are perfect. If anything, you don't want your characters perfect. You want them flawed. You want them relatable. So we try and co combine those elements. But if you don't have empathy, I'm, I'm not sure what you've created. Agreed. Agreed. <laughs> um, this will be our last question, unless someone else has another one. Are there contemporary TV shows that you would recommend our aspiring TV writers or directors check out for inspiration? Yeah, Shadow, Dead Places, um, <laughs> our new film. Um, I think there's there's so much good television at the moment. Um, you know, I've been watching Squid Games. <laughs> Is that yeah. your right name? Is it Squid Games? I'm, I think it's Squid Games. And what it's just blown my mind how clever it is, how compelling it is. And, and it's just so terrific to see um, the Korean culture in that way. Um, so I don't know what shows I could specifically point to. Um, I think for, for aspirant filmmakers out there, I would rather point to the basics of filmmaking, which in my opinion is if you have limited resources, um, these days with the technology that's available to you, even your smartphone, now you can record substantial stuff, limited setting, a couple of actors and a tight atmospheric story atmospheric story with empathy. Um, but in terms of the big, the big Hollywood shows, they kind of, the big Hollywood TV shows depress me because they're so good. You know, like um, the latest one with Kate Winslet, so good. You know, yeah. watch a Queen's Gambit and I just look at the set design on Queen's Gambit and I just like, um, you know, so, you know, for aspirant filmmakers, it's tough to watch the big Hollywood stuff because it really is so good. Um, but I think Aaron Sorkin, is you know most most novelists um especially we look at Aaron Sorkin and we go wow he's just so talented he's you know so, um, so talented I mean every word matters uh, even yes. though it's, it's verbose often it's long I mean um I was I was watching something with Jeff Daniels and he was talking about how tough it is to do Sorkin um because you know they, they don't change a word on set um I think it's is it the newsroom I, I forget the name of the yes. show he was saying that you know it's Aaron Sorkin you don't change Aaron Sorkin it's every word matters and, and you know you have to go the whole hog and he talks about you know some days it's like eight nine ten pages of dialogue but when you when you're a genius like Sorkin is um you know it doesn't really matter so I think if you if you're an aspirant filmmaker and you want to look at the best I, I wouldn't look any further than him oh my gosh you're a kindred spirit I say the same thing <laughs> Sorkin is so intentional every single word matters um, I probably read just about every script that Script Lab actually has that's available mm. for him. Even Shonda Rhimes says he is the sensei for her. She's read everything that he's ever, yeah. ever done. <laughs> that being, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for, for taking the time again. We wish you much success on all of your endeavors. And uh, if you ever get a chance to come to Santa Barbara, we'd love to see you in person. Wendy, thanks so much. And as I said at the start of this off, off, off camera, I really just, um, it's a great opportunity for us. You know, we, we're at the southern tip of the world um, and we're just honored that you guys even thought to, to, to talk to us. So thanks very much. And we hope if there's Shadow fans out there, keep watching. Maybe there will be a season two one day. So thanks very much. We're rooting for it, for sure, <laughs> for sure. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care.